Hola. Hola and bienvenidos to the Steve Funds Girls Rising series. Today's workshop is Sin Vergüenza, Sanando One Day at a Time, Recognizing Our Womanhood and Mental Health While Honoring Our Latinx Communities and Families. Next slide, please. My name is Monica Inkovet, and I am the Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Steve Fund. I am so proud that the Steve Fund is offering this workshop during May Mental Health Awareness Month. Growing up, I usually associated the term sinvergüenza as having a negative connotation, implying shamelessness. Um, today, we are taking ownership of this term. We are proud of our heritage, unapologetic about who we are and what we have to offer, we are happy to present this workshop as a celebration of our culture and a demonstration of our commitment to mental health. Next slide. Before we get started, I wanted to share a little background on the Steve Fund. The Steve Fund was started by the Rose family who lost their son, Steve, to mental illness and suicide in 2014. The Rose family began a journey to help create awareness and build support for the mental health and emotional well being of students. The Steve Fund is a national organization dedicated to the mental health and emotional well being of young people of color. Next slide. Our vision is that every young person of color is supported by programs and services that value and promote their mental health and emotional well being. So, thank you for joining us today to help us make this vision a reality. Next slide. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Mabel Terrero Salcedo, our wonderful presenter. Mabel is a licensed clinical social worker and mental health specialist who received her degree from Columbia University School of Social Work in the city of New York. Mabel made her way to New York in 2012 from her home country, Dominican Republic, with the mission to further her education and grow professionally as a therapist and social justice advocate. Since her transition to the United States, Mabel's work has focused on helping individuals and families have access to culturally sensitive mental health care and to empower Latinx communities through education and normalization of the impact of mental illness. Now living in California, Mabel works as a maternal mental health therapist at Stanford's Children's Hospital. We are so fortunate to have Mabel with us today. So let us welcome her to our virtual stage. Thank you so much, Monica and the Steve Fund for giving me the opportunity to, to be here today, present with all of you in this space and to engage in such an important topic. Um, just like uh, Monica was saying earlier, it is, uh, I wanted to, to really uh, refocus what sinvergüenza means, right? And taking that negative connotation and really using it as, as an empowering statement now, right now for all of us. Because talking about mental health makes people uncomfortable. And we want to be able to really bring out uh, light and um, an understanding on why is this so important for our communities and why it's important to really speak loudly on this topic. So let's throw out the shame away. No tenemos vergüenza hoy. We're just going to really engage and talk about this important topic. I apologize for any technical um, issues that may happen. Um, uh, but I want to start uh, today with our intentions. Um, and I recognize that um, all of you that are participating, I won't be able to see your beautiful faces. Um, but I want you to still be uh, a part of this workshop, of this webinar, uh, and engage as much as, as much as possible. So we're going to start by talking about our agreements in a little bit. Uh, but the intention of today, one of them is to name it, to what is mental health and how do we feel it as Latinx women, right? How it's felt in our homes, in our communities, uh, to help us break the stigma that is around mental health um, in the Latinx community and to break the barriers that keep us from really talking about why this matters. We're going to learn about self-care. We're going to do a little bit of practice here together. Um, and uh, I invite you all to do it in such a um, full way, right? Like I want you to be able to feel it 
and especially knowing that no one can really see you. Um, so uh, losing all the vergüenza, like I said before. And also talking about wellness resources that are available to all of us um, uh, that work with you, uh, that are you, and that continue the conversation in our communities. So let's start by going over the objectives. Um, so some of the objectives that we are uh, going to focus on today is understanding how mental health disorders impact the Latinx community, how it shows up in our homes and how it impacts our own experience as Latina women. Our gain skills to recognize and break the stigma around mental health illness in the Latinx community, reflect on our personal journeys and learn how to identify mental health needs, learning skills to practice wellness on our, our strengths, and our cultures and maintain personal well-being at the same time. And lastly, to identify resources and learn strategies to secure mental health care for ourselves and for the people in our lives. So let's start with the community agreements. Um, I want everybody uh, and I invite everyone to come with an empowering attitude. And that means that we are really going to show up for ourselves show up for the people that came before us, the women that were before uh, us, that raised us and that brought us in this world um, and choosing to change the attitude at, towards mental health, completely change it to something more positive and more empowering. Engaging as best as you can, using the chat um, to express your feelings, express thoughts and experiences that you've had. Go ahead and throw some smiley faces if it's possible and in your own um, space to dance it out. I'm going to make you dance out a little bit later. Um, also important to respect each other, respect how we all uh, come into the space, um, show appreciation. You can use the chat to do so, to uh, others that may engage in the chat, um, to the slides, to the information that's here and affirm this information. Um, more importantly than anything, come in with an open mind and heart. Right. I know we're going to be talking about very difficult things that happen within our community that uh, impact our mental health, but coming in with, with an open mind and being able to really um, sit with ourselves with, with the conversations that we're going to have today. Uh, and in that sense, honoring your feelings, right? Being mindful that other people may be feeling it too, um, or maybe feeling completely something completely different than what you feel, but it's also as valuable. And most importantly, let's just have fun. Let's have fun in our own homes uh, with, uh, with the slides, with this information, and with the knowledge that we're going to receive today. So I want to take a second um, and really go to the, to the beginning. So what is mental health? What is salud mental? Um, you will see me today talking a little bit in Spanglish, and I hope that that's OK. Um, but mental health determines how we think, how we feel and act in the world around us, right? It's, a, it's the interconnectedness and the balance between five different parts of every human being, which involves the emotional, the psychological, the social well-being, our physical well-being, and our spirituality. It's an essential part of being a human being, right? Um, it's, a, it's something that is intrinsic, meaning that it's a part of who we are. It's something that comes within us. Uh, and that means that it's real and that it's complex and that needs to be talked about. Um, and something that I love to really highlight to the people that I work with is the importance that mental health has just as physical health. This is just as important. And sometimes our physical health is really um, is really determined on how we're doing emotionally, how we're doing with our mental health and how well we're taking care of that part. And we'll talk a little bit of how that looks like in a little bit. Um, and it's necessary for to have a balance and not, on how to navigate the world that is around us and also the world that is within us. So talking about mental health, it's important to, to really reflect on how um, it is felt in the Latinx community. Right. Um, this is something that we all understand. It's not something that we talk about often. Right. In our homes, we really don't have the opportunities to talk about what's going on, talk about the feelings. Actually, expressing any feelings is sometimes frowned upon in some homes, especially in Latinx homes, where uh, we're not allowed to talk about feelings 
We're not allowed to show emotions, to show sadness or, or worry, or to be upset, to be enojada, right? Um, men, Latinx men are usually told you can't cry. That's sh showing weaknesses, right? Um, and, and all of this is felt and is um, highlighted even more by the stigma that is around our homes, right? There is the belief that if anything is happening for us, um, we are crazy, right? Um, that if we go to the doctor, the psychologist, or if we go to a, a therapist, that means that we're crazy, right? And, and this idea that you don't really air out anything that, is, that happens within the home, anything that happens um, within yourself. No se sacan los trapos sucios a casa de nadie, right? Uh, this is the idea that we constantly hear from our families. But one thing that we do know is that Latinos are the largest, fastest growing minority group within the United States with 54 million people that identify as Latin, Latinx, right? And then that makes up to 17% of the total population. And this number is expected to grow by 2030. Only seven years from now is expected that the Latinx community will encompass about a fourth of the total population. This is why it matters, right? Um, there, is, um, there is also the, the difficulty the Lat Latinos, Latinx experience on accessing mental health care, which is impacted by being able to, um, to really go into systems where we are able to get the, the care that we need by appropriate um, psychotherapists, appropriate providers that are able to understand our culture and understand even our, uh, the way that we speak and that are linguistically trained to be able to provide services to us. So, just like Monica said um, at the beginning, I felt mo even more joy coming in today to this group to talk about mental health, especially for this month, the month of May, that is recognized as the National Mental Health Awareness Month. So uh, I invite all of us to really think about the importance of having these conversations within our homes and in our communities. Some of the things that we experience as Latinos is being seen as happy people, right? 66% of the U.S. population sees Latinos as being happy people. And that is a concept that, although it sounds beautiful, it also uh, negates the actual struggles that we go through, right? The Latinos are less likely to receive any care for depression compared to other groups. One in 10 or one in 11 seek actual care. And that number reduces significantly among immigrant Latinx communities. Uh, being one in every 10, in 20. This is a major problem. Um, and a lot of the issues that happen for Latinos is how to access the mental health care, the appropriate mental health care. Like we said before, language barriers, right? Um, up to uh, 2022, only 7% of the psychotherapists or uh, providers of mental health identify as Latinos, right? according to the American Psychological Association. This is a very, very low number. And this affects the quality of care and the access to care for mental health for the Latino population. Another big problem is the lack of insurance, right? With at least 21.1% of Latinos not, being able, not having any insurance and therefore not being able to access care compared to 7.5 of their white non-Latinos counterparts. <clears throat> the cultural differences, right, that exist within the field, the lack of, of providers, like we said before, and more importantly, the lack of knowledge of where to go and get treatment. Where, do, where am I going to be able to really be seen by a, by a provider and being understood by someone? Um, and even um, uh, smaller barriers, if you will, not smaller at all, but uh, things like transportation, having transportation and being able to go to hospitals or being able to go to clinics uh, to get the care that you need, right? Um, and even sometimes now with uh, one of the good things that came out of the pandemic, if, if you can say something, is the access to telehealth care, right? Uh, but even that can be problematic for uh, Latinx communities, especially when we live in multi-generational homes where we might be with our abuelos and abuelas and our parents and then our cousins and our siblings and so many different people uh, within our homes that makes it really, really hard, especially for Latinx youth 
to feel comfortable, to have privacy and be able to speak freely about the issues that going on, are going on for them. Within that same realm of uh, COVID-19 and, um, and how it impacted, we understand also how 66% of farm workers um, identified mental health issues during the pandemic, right? So this is a growing problem. Okay, so taking a second to really look at the different uh, social issues that impact our communities, right? Um, number one being racism and discrimination. Um, it is seen um, in our, in our communities, how much we are affected by in the media, by the messages that are uh, being um, told by about Latinos, right? What is out there, how we are categorized, um, uh, being labeled as crazy and lazy, drunks, right? Taking job opportunities from the American people, um, which is a really negative view of the powerful people that Latinx are. The immigration process and um, all of the battles that people and the struggles that people have to go through, especially the Latinx community through the immigration process. Latinx immigrants have endured trauma prior to engaging in leaving their home countries while they're in the migrating process. And even once they come into the US and they settle in, they continue to experience different types of trauma that affects their mental health. For young Latinx, uh, who are immigrants, they often face challenges in their everyday lives um, that can look like a language barriers and not being able to communicate with other people and even the cultural differences, right? Um, the fear of repercussion and deportation that exists as a, as a kind of a ghost, right? That is always like hanging close to us <laughs> um, of like, what can happen if we take the wrong step? What do we have to do to make sure that we are assimilating and acculturating into this um, to the system so that we don't uh, we're not targets for uh, for anyone to look at us right and to and to possibly face deportation and with that the pathway to citizenship which is very difficult for every single person um, even currently with all the laws changing with article 42 ending and people trying to seek asylum and trying to seek, a better life for themselves and their families, escaping violence um, and, and more issues going on in their home countries, right? Um, like Monica shared before, I, I am one immigrant that is a professional here, right? But I left my country uh, over 10 years ago uh, and with the hopes of bettering myself as a professional um, and still being able to serve the community, right? And with that also comes um, having to adjust to a new uh, to a new country and having to adjust to to the the things that come about in being um, leaving your home country and being somewhere completely different that still sees you um, with very blurry vision. And more importantly, um, sorry to go back. More importantly, the language differences, right? Um, I, I wonder, and please feel free to use the chat to share, like if there, if this is something that has ever come up for you, having an accent, right? Um, I oftentimes hear when I speak to someone, where are you from? Like, I can tell you have an accent. Yes, 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 I do. And I am proud to say that I have an accent, but it's that even that like coming into a conversation with someone and the possibility that my language, um, that you're someone is gonna notice that I have an accent and that I'm not really, um, originally from here, or my family's not from here. Now, when we look at also mental health, we need to go all the way back and all the way back to where um, our lands and we recognize that our lands were being already habited uh, by other people, by native people, by the indigenous people and, and how their history was mostly erased by colonialism um, and the colonizers, right? It is important to recognize the inheritance that we have from our, the four main groups of indigenous people, uh, the Mayas and the Aztecs and the Incas, and then and in the Caribbean, the Tainos, the indigenous Tainos, who were really great resourceful and innovative people that without um, any other information that 
what they had back then, were able to build um, beautiful um, pyramids, aqueduct systems. They were able to be really good experts at farming, at agriculture, and fishing. And that depended on how they would live their lives, right? They were great astronomers and um, excellent engineers and architectures without all of the knowledge that exists up to this day. So that goes to show the power that our ancestors had prior to, um, to being displaced and for La Raza to be extinct. And, um, and unfortunately, you know, within the research, we learned that uh, a lot of the history that started way before colonialism has been erased or has been told um, on, from the eyes of the colonizer which really does, depicts us as Latinos as um, in, a, in a negative view, right? Uh, it makes us feel, uh, or it makes, it makes it feel for our, our ancestors to be uh, people that didn't have enough knowledge or ways to, to communicate when in fact they had alphabets, right? And they were, uh, they were really resourceful in the way that they created systems for themselves, even social hierarchical systems within um, their, their different groups. Um, so it, because of that, it is very imper imperative that we recognize the perseverance and strength and the abilities that came from our ancestors and, that, and to use that to help serve for us as inspiration to the new generations of Latinos that now are growing in this ever-changing world and facing so many challenges that continue to uh, evolve as we go on especially for our Latinx youth. It is important that we recognize that we come from a legacy of adaptable, determined, and hardworking people who invented these concepts and ideas that we still use to this day. And even the colonizers themselves uh, were able to apply. And with all of that um, comes the historical and collective trauma that has fit, feed into our, our own existence to this day, right? Uh, the battles that um, our ancestors had to go through to defend the land um, and also how uh, much violence they had to, to uh, sustain. And that informs this idea of this notion of being in survival mode, right? Having to keep pushing forward, right? Because this is what we have to do. We have to continue to adapt to whatever dangers or violence we face. As, as, a, as a population. And with that comes also the pain um, and the shame of losing our identities, losing part of our cultures, losing part of who we are and how our ancestors lived before us, uh, which, which really leads to the, this idea of keeping silence um, and keeping secrecies, even within our own homes. I wonder how this is um, felt for you specifically uh, within your own homes where there is this notion, this general notion of like keeping secrets, even keeping secrets when we're feeling sick, right? Um, if, if one of our own is having a hard time or um, is experiencing some mental health issue, that has to be kept a secret. No one can know, right? No one can, um, can know what's happening within our doors because it feels unsafe. And with that comes the grief, right? The grief of losing <clears throat> our voice, losing um, our cultures, losing um, all of the different ways that we've uh, been able to, to be strong people. Um, and with that as well, I think it's important to recognize that we do come from really strong people uh, that were able to, to really show up for themselves and, and fight back as much as possible uh, for forces that were, um, that just came without any, any knowledge, right? Without any anticipation and, and try to erase the history that we have. So I think it's really important for Latinx U to recognize the surmountable possibilities that exist when a group of people are determined to overcome adversities. And that is an example that we really can take from the, uh, from the history of our people. So now continuing on to navigating the bicultural and multicultural identities that we all hold, right? 
um, in the bicultural, uh, we can start to think about our own uh, cultures from within our, um, our homes, right? Um, in my home, I'm Dominican. So I recognize that this is my main culture, but then coming to the, to the United States, then I have to navigate being Dominican in a whole different land, right? But we also know that the world is evolving and the world is changing and some other cultures join, right? And what does, what does that mean uh, to have different cultures within yourself, right? And what does it mean when, with the community and the identity that you have um, within yourself, within your home, and versus what society looks like, right? What America looks like. Um, also navigating the differences within even our parents or our ancestors, right? Where um, the people that came before us are uh, usually more traditional in their thinking uh, and more reserved as opposed to the current uh, youth, right? That are progressive and liberal and they speak up on, uh, on the issues that are happening. I think that is something really powerful of our, uh, about our Latinx community and our Latinx youth more than anything. Uh, navigating as well, the family values and the beliefs that we hold and the experiences that we hold in our own homes and in our own uh, groups, as opposed to the differences that we experience outside um, in our different circles that we are surrounded by or that we encounter. Right? How does the dichotomy of that looks like? Um, and that can bring about a lot of issues as well for Latinx youth on like trying to really hold what our families tell us and the values that, um, that our parents and our elders uh, find important and also the differences of just the current age, right? And the current status of the world. Um, also, we cannot go without talking about machismo versus Marianismo, right? The machismo is this patriarchal um, uh, thinking that the man holds the power and that the man is the one that um, dictates how systems works, how family works, and versus Marianismo, where this is more of like the woman's role in the home of taking care of the family and, and doing it be and do what is being told by the by the macho man, right? Um, another part that is really important to the identity of Latinx youth is um, being source of support for parents, right? Uh, we tend to be the interpreters or the mediators for our parents. Being on the phone and like trying to navigate systems that they do not understand, do not understand, sometimes medical systems, sometimes the legal system. And, um, and as their kids trying to be able to interpret and translate the information that they're receiving, right? Also the importance of education that is so important for a lot of um, young adults and Latinx youth um, versus the duty to care for our families. That is uh, that we're reminded constantly by the people that, um, that we love and that love us. And with all of that, and even talking about the intergenerational uh, struggles that we talked about earlier, comes the, the need to assimilate to the language and the culture in America, right? Because if we don't do that, then it feels unsafe. Then there are uh, potential risks and dangers that can come about if we don't do our part to assimilate to what is the culture that we live, that surrounds us in the society. Okay. So now let's take a little second and stop listening to me for once and just think about all of the things that we've talked about um, as of this moment and think about how this has impacted your mental health and your life. So if you can take a second um, and if you can in, uh, put in the chat how all of these issues that we just talked about, uh, how they show up for yourself and how they impact your mental health. The chat is moving, so. And Anosa, if you're able to read out uh, what's in the chat, I don't think I can see it as easily. If anyone is participating.
Okay. So let's continue. Oh, Mabel, I actually got something in the chat. Okay, perfect. Please go ahead. Jezebel says it's difficult to receive support from family because they are not used to this more open way of thinking. I feel alone sometimes, but also recognize that I have to heal for myself and them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That is very much something that I can relate to, right? Even having the words to express what comes up for us. What are the things that we are experiencing? And, and, un, and feeling unable to do, to have these conversations, to hold these conversations in our homes because of the fear of being misunderstood, right? Um, or not even being heard or the possibility that, uh, that we will be overwhelming uh, the people that we live with or that we uh, hold close to us. Anyone else? Yes, we've got a couple more. Someone wrote constantly having low self-esteem and it's hard to take care of yourself when you have to put your family's needs above your own. Someone else said it's pretty harsh to experience and unlearn much of this conditioning. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for saying that. And that's something that we're gonna touch on very quickly um, in, a few, in a few slides. Um, thank you everyone for really sharing um, how this experience has impacted you. I think it's important to really name uh, how it looks and how it feels for all of us. And if anyone else, I think I see more coming into the chat. One last one. Okay. So I want us to take a second and to watch this video. Um, I, I don't know if any of you um, know about uh, this uh, person, cat, uh, cat Call. She, I think this video really represents some of the issues that we face, especially within our, with our parents, right? And, and the experience of mental health in our communities. We're gonna watch a couple of minutes of it. Okay, me too. So let me stop because we're gonna take a try. Yeah. Ay, Dios mío. Otra vez con ese show. Pero, ¿qué te pasa? Nothing. I'm fine. Mira, mijo. I know you have been having a tough time. Pero no seas tan exagerado. Hagamos algo. Vienes a la casa, descansas un poquito. I will cook you dinner. Y ya verás que todo va a estar bien. It's not that easy. I've been talking to my psychologist and she... La psicóloga esa, pero si tú no estás loco. Te mandamos a la universidad. And suddenly, everything is about self-care, therapy, and all of this white people nonsense. What? Sorry to interrupt, but care for mental health isn't just a white people thing. Yeah, I'm sorry, ¿qué haces metida aquí en mi carro? This is the cat call and we're calling this shit out. Cuidado con esa boca. Why is it hard for Latinos to talk about mental health? Well, there are a lot of factors at play, but there seem to be two major hurdles. One, cultural stigma. Sure, mental illness is generally stigmatized by everyone, but culturally, Latinos seem to perceive mental health care as a luxury or an indulgence rather than a necessary part of our health, which is why your tia thinks that going to therapy or taking medication for mental illness is a rich white people thing. Cultural stigma is one of the reasons why Latinos are actually less likely to report mental illness. My mother hid that she was seeing a therapist for me when I was younger, and my father has been very anti-therapy until today in his 60s when he sees his own therapist. I can't help but feel that my parents hid and hesitated going to therapy for the same reason that I may not always speak so openly about going to therapy myself. Because culturally, we're taught that those of us who seek help somos locos or acomplejados. We're taught to be stronger and push through the pain and that seeking help in forms of therapy or medication is seen as weakness. Plus, add on the expectation that if our parents and our grandparents have suffered so much without any outside help, then why can't we? And this stigma contributes to why only 27% of Latinos with a probable need for mental health care reported that they would seek treatment versus the 40% of white non-Latinos who would. So where does this stigma come from? This stigma is only further perpetuated when there's a serious lack of Latino psychologists to normalize the field and make it culturally accessible for our families. In 2013, only 5% of psychologists identified as Latino. That's super small. I mean, there are more Latinos who voted for Trump than there are Latino psychologists. And Lord knows, we can all use a little more therapy now than ever. Pero yo no voy a los doctores. No tengo fe en ellos. 
People of color have an unfortunate but very real distrust of medical treatment, many of whom might have grown up in a generation when, for example, Puerto Rican women were subject to forced sterilization, Central Americans were infected with STIs by the U.S. government, and a number of other abuses, which were then written off in history books as medical research. Finally, religion can also play a big role in the cultural stigma that Latinos have about caring for their mental health. Many deeply religious people might feel that all you have to do is pray and God will take care of it. Now, there's nothing wrong with turning to prayer, meditation, or any other sort of spirituality in difficult times. But that doesn't have to be your only solution when your health is at stake. So no need to drop out of your church choir just because you're seeing a therapist or taking medication for your mental health. You can do both. But it's not just cultural. Okay, let's stop right here because uh, I think she's really good okay. at pointing out uh, some of the things that come up for us. Um, and let's take a second to think about the messages that we hear uh, in our homes about mental health or mental illness, right? Does it resonate with some of the things that Kat said? Especially the mom saying, why are you going to the psychologist? No estás, tú estás loco, right? This is a, one of the main things that happen. Please uh, uh, feel free to share in the chat how this shows up for you. I'll share uh, while you input in the chat that that was something that I um, ident I identify with very much. So go try when I decided to go into school for psychology uh, and for social work, um, my my father was like, "Why would you waste your time with that? Right? Um, there is no need for you to mention or think about mental health. Uh, you're fine. You're healthy. Right? Tú no estás loca." These are the types of messages that we hear in our homes. And just like uh, Kat was saying, um, I grew up seeing a lot of people in my family struggle with a lot of different mental health issues, even if it's, you know, um, anxiety, right? Um, and, and, sh and seeing how that looks like for them and no one really talking about the, the need to go out and seek care and seek support. Um, or even education about this. And I see some people are participating in the chat. Please let me know what messages you hear in your home. Of course. Uh, one person wrote, I didn't go to therapy and I turned out fine. That's in quotations. And they yeah. said they are really not fine. Another person wrote, definitely the need to endure or be strong since, quote, they had it worse. So we had to carry their weight and our own, but not be allowed to decompress. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're often hearing how our parents had it worse and our grandparents had it even worse. Right. Um, but that does not negate the fact that for ourselves in this current world, we are experiencing the not not so much the same, but very similar issues or similar feelings to what they were feeling. I remember when I actually engaged in therapy when I was in school, which is part of uh, the training as therapist is to engage in therapy. Uh, my mom asked me, why have you, have you been in therapy for so long? Is there something wrong? As if, it, as if being in treatment means uh, for an ongoing time means that something is really um, affecting me, right? Which it is. <laughs> another participant has wrote, written, um, Parents feeling shame for their children's mental health struggles has in some way normalized gaslighting or invalidating experiences as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we hear often our, our parents or people in our lives that um, really uh, minimize how we feel, minimize the, the issues that go on uh, for us, the, the hurdles or the battles that we have to face within our own groups and within society. Um, and, and negating that that exists, right? Um, and, and using that actually as a form of weakness, like making us feel as if we are weak, to, to feel sad, to feel anger, uh, to, to, feel, to be fearful of the things that go on in the world, especially as Latinx um, youth, especially if we come from immigrant um, families, um, having to deal with the fact that we are fearful for something that may happen to us or to our loved ones. How about in the community at large or in social media, right? In the news, Twitter, how do, what are the messages that you hear uh, and that you see in your feeds, right?
And I will say, I think that Latinx youth and youth in general um, are experiencing uh, an opportunity to really be verbal about all of these issues and speak out. I constantly see uh, in social media, I'm not super active, but when I do go on, I do see a lot of youth right now speaking up and really bringing about more awareness about the issues that happen for themselves internally or for people that they, they encounter for their peers. Okay. So now let's talk about what is mental illness, right? We know what mental health is, what is mental illness, and how does it show up for us? Um, this is an example of different uh, symptoms, right? Early symptoms of mental health illness. And I wanna highlight the, the number one uh, most debilitating uh, mental health disorder or issue in the Latinx community is depression. 22% uh, of Latinx youth report depressive symptoms higher than any other groups besides the Native American youth. This is alarming, right? This means that our, our youth is suffering, is suffering and is suffering in silence. And that can look like um, symptoms that we really feel in our body. Research has really has proven to us that for the Latinx community, um, the symptoms are expressed more in a somatic form, which means in, within your body. So constantly we see uh, people coming in to, uh, to their doctors for headaches or for stomach pains and thinking that this is something physical, when in reality is it could possibly be, most likely it is uh, a, a demonstration, your body demonstrating that it's not doing well, but it's mostly your mental health that is, um, that is not doing well right? Um, major depression is actually the most common diagnosis which uh, within the Latinx community, and this diagnosis can start as early uh, as, as 25. So we start having symptoms in our, adult, in our adolescence. Uh, we see a lot, of chill, a lot of youth going through all of these issues, right? Anger management issues, having excessive fears or worries, inability to cope with the stress, having a lot of problems with concentrating, right? Being unable to focus in school, being unable to focus outside of school, having paranoia, um, having sleep problems that can look like sleeping too much or in the contrary, sleeping very little. And that is, is an indication that it could be depression, right? And if it's sleeping very little, it can give us a kind of like an idea that it may be anxiety. And it's the same thing with eating people that overeat, right? Because they're really trying to, um, to compensate or being able to handle their emotions by just eating or, or, uh, or not eating enough, right? And really keeping our bodies from, from, uh, from nutrition sources. And with all of that, with the combination of all these symptoms, then some of the red flags that we see as therapists is the excessive use of alcohol or drugs, right? A lot of youth resort to self-medication because this is what they need. They don't know what else to do. They can't talk about it at home. They can't really go to a doctor for the most part without their parents knowing. So what do they do is that they start, they start using drugs, alcohol, cannabis, a lot of vaping that is very concerning within our youth. And something that is very dangerous um, and really, really difficult to talk about is suicidal thinking, right? when we've been feeling all of these different symptoms and we don't know how to, um, how to sit with it, how, what to do with it. And so we start to really think about self-harming or having to think about maybe if I'm better off dead, maybe my family will be better off if I'm dead. So let's take a second and let's think about do we talk about these feelings with anyone in our lives, right? Um, as Latinx youth, or, as, or if you work with people uh, that identify as Latinx, uh, and specifically youth, is this something that, that you hear um, them talking about with their peers, right? With their friends, with their cousins? Is this something that you talk about with your friends and cousins or your partners? And taking it one more step with other women in your life. Is this something that really comes up or is easy for all of us to do, talking about feelings? 
please share in the chat. I think it's also really important um, to highlight that Latinx youth experiences the highest levels of depressive symptoms than any other racial ethnic, ethnic groups. And this is problematic. And because of that, it has the highest rates of suicidality. In 2019, the CDC reported that at least over 4,000 Latinos uh, of all ages died by suicide with 400, almost 500 of those um, being under the age of 19. This is how we understand that this is a problem. We need to talk about our feelings. And that's how so, I mm -hmm. so we've got a couple of things in the chat. One person said, I share more easily with my friends and primas closer to my age. Mm -hmm. Another one of another one person said, I've found more community outside of my home where I feel safe to talk about these topics in my healing circle. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I will share with you that the one person that I speak to the most about mental health issues in my family is my little cousin, um, which probably is around the age group of the of the participants here. And if not, uh, when I was young, I had to seek out speaking about these issues with people that are outside of my home because I didn't have the, the opportunity to do it so much at home, right? Because I was afraid of how my parents would think of me asking questions or trying to understand what, what to do with this feeling of sadness, right? How do I deal with it? So yes, talking, finding other people in our lives sometimes is necessary. It's a means of survival. Finding people that we can talk about this. Definitely our primas. Okay. Thank you so much for participating. This is very meaningful, uh, this conversation. Um, as we think of Latinx uh, culture, right? It's important to also highlight uh, the importance of religion and spiritual practices. Um, as we know, part of um, how um, we all come about religion comes from, uh, from going back all the way to colonization, right? And uh, Catholicism and Christianity being um, ingrained in our culture or enforced in our cultures. However, um, I think that using Catholicism or Christianity can be super helpful for some people, for some families to really navigate some of the issues that happen for them. It's actually one of the ways that Latinx communities deal with issues, right? With internal issues through prayers. Um, we know, I don't know if any of you have heard it, but I heard it so much growing up. Just pray it out, you know, que Dios se encarga, right? Like, if you pray, rezale a Papa Dios que todo lo, lo sana. Is this really true though, right? Like sometimes I don't think that that's some, enough for us to really feel supported or feel understood with our mental health issues. But it can be a place of comfort and recentering, right? Through prayer, through hope, um, and following different doctrines that also um, continue to grow in society. And one important thing in certain cultures, definitely in my culture, is the idea of superstition, right? <laughs> Catholic, uh, Catholics are really big on superstition, um, or even if you're not within Catholicism, is the idea that you, if you do something, there is a repercussion, right? It can be positive and it can be negative. How does that look like, right? Okay. And moving on specifically to the to address our population today, right? Our Latinx women, navigating the the gender roles, right, and the differences that we internally feel, and the ways that we identified ourselves as uh, women, as you know, queer women or non-binary, um, as opposed to how our the women in our lives uh, grew up. Right, and having all of these different languages. So the idea that women are supposed to take care of the family, right? Um, it's like we are born with this um, expectation that we are going to be taking care of our, our, of our own, right? Uh, the expectation that we are going to marry, right? Um, and from a very early age, uh, becoming parents, right? The parentified, uh, uh, parentified youth, 
which means uh, that we start to take care of our younger siblings or family members that are ill within our homes. And this is a responsibility that women have, taking care of the house as well, right? <clears throat> and um, as we often experience as women, uh, being labeled as crazy women or the spicy Latinas, right? Um, if we if we even show up, I'll show off a little bit of, um, of what do you say? Even if it's a little bit of energy, right? A little bit of discomfort of something or our thoughts about something, we are uh, we are conceptualized as the spicy the spicy Latinas, the feisty Latinas. This is something that we see very often. Um, and within our culture, um, and specifically with social media and, and, and television, right? And when we separate from all these traditional roles and expectations, then we are seen as malcriadas, right? Then our families have issues with that. Um, and, and we're constantly being told how we are going against the family, we are being disobedient, desobediente, right? Please feel free to share in the chat how, um, how this um, affects you, how this shows up for you. I will continue. Um, also important to highlight um, the, the struggles that we face uh, when we navigate academics um, and our future goals, our career goals. Um, Go, having to, uh, to navigate how that looks like in our home, right? The expectations from our parents and our families, right? My dad told me like, I want you to go to, why don't you go be a doctor? Why don't you try to be an engineer? When I told him what I wanted to do was uh, psychology and, my, and how much I care about mental health and speaking about that, right? That was different for me. Um, being told at one point that uh, I had the idea of wanting to be a designer, and my mom being like, no, you're not gonna do that. Go do another career and then maybe you'll do designing. So it's like this, this battle of like, what I wanna do with myself and what versus what my parents or my family expects of me. And sometimes prioritizing education, right? Sometimes prioritizing education and wanting to, um, to do better for ourselves, for our lives and for our future um, and having issues with our family members because they, expect us to be present for family needs, to take care of the family. And as we, and as we go into the professional world, trying to find financial security, right? And that can look like in, um, in being uh, developing as a professional in a field or even through marriage. And sometimes feeling like you, you have to go through marriage so that you are able to, to survive. Okay, I think I see some people participating in the chat. Okay. okay, so now let's take us some time um, to really reflect on the expectations that we hear from our family and our communities. Do those match with our own uh, expectations or our visions for the future for ourselves? And if they don't, how does that impact your mental health and yourself? How does it impact what you tell yourself, right? Personally, I had to sit with the fact that my parents wanted me to do other, other things, right? And I actually don't, uh, um, I, I, I love, let's say better yet, that I was able to, to take what my parents said, take it into consideration and still do something that I really find joy and passion with, right? Uh, but having to to tell them, no, I don't want to become a doctor. It's not my interest, right? That's not what I want to do with my life. So if anybody feels like they want to share, if your families or your community expectations of yourself and your future, if they match the ones that you have for yourself.
and feel free to, uh, as you do this reflection, um, remind yourself that this is an internal process, even though I, I do um, advise you to, to put it in the chat, I recognize that this is something personal to us, right? Um, and this is something that we're probably possibly constantly navigating um, for ourselves, especially for Latinx youth right now, navigating what we're going to decide to go to school for if we're going to go to school. Mabel, someone has written in the chat, parents projecting their survival mode mindsets while, while well intended, but not always compassionate. Absolutely, absolutely. Another person wrote, my family's expectations and definition of success was surrounded by academic achievements and making a lot of money. My dedication to myself and my healing journey is my definition of success because I've been able to heal the parts of myself that they didn't know how to support or nurture. I love that. I really love that. I think it's so important to really sit with ourselves and ask ourselves, is what my parents, what the people in my life telling me really going to make me happy, right? And sometimes making the decision that I'm going to go against what they say, even if I understand that they mean well, they, they want to protect me, they want to uh, secure my life in the future by making like having a job that makes more money but that's going to in turn make me more miserable, right? And, and, and sometimes it's really difficult to even face our parents or the people that we love in telling them, no, this is not what I want. I decide not to go against or, you know, or not to, to really take in what you're suggesting because it's not going to make me feel good, right? And, acad and being um, uh, academically successful is important, but it does not mean that it, it's everything in my life. I completely resonate with that. My parents were really much about um, studying and nothing else. I remember trying to go to hip hop classes and, um, and lasting three months because then it was like, no, that's not important. You need to go back to school or you need to go learn English, right? Or learn some other language because that's what's gonna help you in the future. Another person wrote, my mother and family pushed me to focus on feasible degrees that will make more money and more job opportunities instead of following my passions. Yes, yes. When we have to really give up on our dreams, give up on how we see ourselves, right? Because it won't give, bring us enough money. I'll tell you, that was one of the things that my dad told me. My dad said, literally, he said, you're going to starve to death if you're going to be a therapist. And, and having to sit with that, right? And, and as a young person, 18 years old, thinking, oh my God, am I making the right decision by taking this career path when I might not make enough money to survive in the future? Absolutely. Okay. So now let's talk about how mental illness shows up, right? And how we as women uh, and as uh, Latinx youth, how we use unhealthy, unhealthy coping mechanisms that, uh, that we use to survive and that we use it so that we can keep going um, and, and somewhat think that we are present in the world. Um, and that can look like avoidance, right? Avoiding situations, avoiding people, avoiding um, anything that makes us feel um, in danger, right? Or makes us feel like we are uncomfortable, right? And, and with the avoidance comes the self-concealment, which means not saying anything, right? I, I can't say anything about how I feel, about what's going on internally for me, about this feeling that I can't even explain, so I'm gonna keep it to myself. I'm not gonna say anything. It's not safe to say anything to anyone. Uh, so I'm gonna just, you know, keep it internally. And how destructive it can be to conceal so much and to hold so much pain, right? Um, and, and sometimes going into social media, right? Um, I know a lot of youth nowadays resort to TikTok, to Instagram, to all of these different platforms uh, in the hopes of finding um, acceptance or like trying to imitate things that socially are okay and, um, and are perceived as positive, but that actually harm us, right? And so many, um, so many stories that we hear professionally as mental health providers of young, um, young children or young adults that uh, are practicing self-harm activities, right? Self-harm behaviors, because they don't know how to cope with the stress. 
They don't know how to cope with the feelings that they're experiencing. And in some cases, um, even leading to suicide, right? Like how we were saying before, the alarming rates of suicide is becoming kind of a, you know, um, an easier, not easier, but a pathway to really handle or cope with the things that are happening for us. Definitely not easy, um, but very, very dangerous, and very, very scary. And, and a lot of youth, when they are thinking about self-harm behaviors and suicide is, is, is basically the last point, right? They, they, they may have tried to talk to someone in their lives, in their lives. They may have tried to seek support or to find resources online by researching, but still not being able to hold conversations or to access care, to really talk about the things that happen and find ways to cope more healthy uh, with the things that are happening for them. And like I said before, using, um, uh, using uh, alcohol and cannabis or vaping as self-medication to be able to cope with the stress of, of life, right? Um, shutting down and completely isolating from our social groups, from our families, um, from media as well. And, and sometimes often also engaging in risky behaviors, putting ourselves in danger, um, engaging in risky sexual activities without enough knowledge, right? Um, of what can happen to us and how our lives can be a danger by doing that. But it feels safe, right? It's a, it's a non-healthy coping mechanism. So now I want us to take a look at um, this young uh, girl who, who shared just briefly how her experience was um, accepting that she needed help um, and seeking care. Taking that first step is kind of scary. Like sitting in that chair, speaking to someone, it was really hard. I'm not someone who tells people things easily. It took me about a month to actually do it. For my initial thought of getting help, it took me about a month to fully convince myself. And in the end, I didn't even seek out help. I asked my friend if she could tell the social worker. I was waking up throughout the night a lot and I couldn't sleep. And I would wake up out of breath. I couldn't breathe. I was very really disoriented. My family and I had thought like it was part of my asthma because I'm asthmatic. And so we went to the doctor and the doctor told us that it was panic attacks. He diagnosed me with general anxiety and depression. He gave me medication that would help me. Once we got home, like, my dad like completely got rid of all the medication. I remember him going on a whole like speech for like about an hour saying how I shouldn't be that weak and that I should be stronger and I shouldn't complain about things. My parents both grew up in difficult situations in their country. Their mentality was what they went through, they came out fine. They didn't have to talk to anyone. So why should I have to talk to anyone? Okay. Taking that first, taking that first step Sorry. is, um, and I see some people are um, participating in the chat. Yeah, we got a, um, a very vulnerable and um, great comment from one of our participants. They said, seeing all of those, um, you know, the things that you listed earlier, they said, seeing it listed like that is, is also confirmation that my feelings were valid and that those were the signs that I should have seek support, but not realizing the self-sabotage. Yes. Grateful to you and other leading and others leading in mental health support, especially for the Latinx community. I love that. I think it's so important, right, to actually see it, to see how we are trying our best to survive. Right? What are the ways that we are really attempting to stay present, if anything, um, and being able to continue to carry on? But it's so powerful to really notice how some of those unhealthy coping skills that we have, uh, we have adapted to use and we have learned um, to use can actually be adding more damage to your mental health. 
And I'm so glad that um, this participant shared that because it, 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 it tells me that this is, act, this is happening to all of us. This, is happen, this was happening to me as a young person and this continues to happen nowadays, right? So, so this is the importance of uh, bringing awareness to, to mental health issues and why it's so important, why it matters so much that we hold these conversations, that we recognize unhealthy coping mechanisms so that we can help our youth to completely leave those behind as possible, as much as possible, and learn to do more uh, healthy coping mechanisms to, to help us to keep going. So I know some other people are participating and I appreciate that so much. Um, I want us to move into the psychological strengths of Latinx. Uh, and I think this is particularly important, especially for those of us who work with, um, with youth, those of us who work in mental health field, um, because we recognize that Latinx communities come with a lot of strengths as well. The first one being determination, which basically means the endless drive and courage to do whatever is necessary to, to meet the goals that you have. And that can look like, you know, coming to a whole different country and earn, earning a degree or for our parents to buy a home, right? Being able to, to make sure that we do everything that we can to, to, to achieve these goals to our betterment. La esperanza, right? We often hear la esperanza es lo último que se pierde. So holding on to the faith that even in the most difficult situations, things will turn out okay. Adaptability, right? Being able to adapt and to thrive in a variety of different um, scenarios and environments. Uh, Latinos have demonstrated that we have this capacity, this incredible capacity to thrive, even in the worst situations, even in, in, in societies like this, right? With different cultures and languages. The strong work ethic. Latinos are uh, ever since uh, since back in, uh, in uh, with our ancestors, recognizing the the importance of uh, productivity, of doing a really good job at what we do, working hard because that will mean that we are going to better ourselves, better our families, better our communities. Right. The connectedness to others. I think that's this is one of the most. Uh, the strongest um, strength the Latina, uh, Latinx communities have is the ability to really value the need of enjoyment and feeling connected emotionally and physically and spiritually to others, right? And being able to share in moments of joy and, um, and life changes and how uh, that can be viewed as a positive thing, right? Being connected to others. The collective emotional expression, right? which is the ability and the need and desire to share strong emotions with each other. And that can go from like experiencing joy and celebrating, and it can also go into, you know, um, a very difficult moments like uh, experiencing grief and pain and loss together, right? Being there for each other when we lose someone in our, in our communities. And we, in, in the collective emotional expression really shows up sometimes um, in, in therapeutic work, uh, through, uh, through the arts, right? Through sports, through literature and art, through rituals and traditions that we hold uh, uh, as, as groups of people. And uh, most importantly also resistance, which is the willpower, right? And the courage that to stand firmly on our own beliefs and our ideas and practices, right? And it's a strength that, that is demonstrated in Latinos when we are determined to defy the odds and, the, and the, the limits that are placed on us by the dominating culture, right? Or the dominating society. Okay, now one way that we can change, um, create change for our mental health is reframing it, right? How to take care of ourselves. And I think that starts by us being able to really change the, the language that we use within ourselves. So affirming, I am worthy, right? I deserve wellness and peace. Even if my family doesn't value that, right? Doesn't value going to a, to a psychologist, to a, a therapist, to a psychiatrist. I deserve this. I know that I'm in pain and I am the only person that can um, take responsibility in that, right? I am not my sadness. I am not my fear. It's okay to ask for help. In spite of how many messages we hear that, that you shouldn't go to, uh, to seek treatment for mental health because you're not local 
or loca, right? And the importance of crying it out and forgiving ourselves, right? For whatever we did when we were in survival mode, because we had to do that. But saying, I recognize how that was a lot for me and what took away from me. And I can do better than that. Okay, I'm gonna take a pause to see as some people are sharing in the chat. So please feel free uh, and also to share what's being said. Of course. So we got a question about any trainings or certifications that you might recommend for our participants in order to support themselves, their families, or their loved ones. That could be two years or less. I know that you're gonna share some resources later on. So if you wanna maybe tackle that question later, feel free. Um, Absolutely. Thank you, Anosa. Okay, um, so now let's just go into looking into wellness practices, right? What can we do for ourselves? And these are things that as therapists we recommend. Um, and we're thinking about the seven different dimensions of wellness in psychotherapy, right? Um, which is bringing about all of the different dimensions uh, uh, of the person, right? The emotional, physical, spiritual, the intellectual part of us, right? Um, and even the social, the environmental um, and occupational, right? So all of these other other, uh, wellness dimensions. What are the things that we can do to really practice self-care, practice positive ways of coping uh, that can look like uh, seeking connections, right? As we talked about the connectedness to others uh, through prayers. Some people really find uh, comfort in praying, going for a walk, being active. If you practice yoga or if you practice dance classes, that's one of my favorites, I will say. Um, eating something rico, something that really feels uh, feeds your soul, right? Uh, journaling, the power of really going in with, uh, with a self-reflection um, and, and really trying to sit with ourselves and, to, and our feelings and the things that come up for us that is so hard to talk to other people. Okay, if you have any wellness practices that you do on your own, please share it with us. Um, I'll share some of the ones that I have actually in the next one, in the next slide. So I want us to do something fun, even though I can't see any of you. And uh, But I want you to, if you're home or if even if you're somewhere public, I want you to take a look. If you're home, take a look around you and finding something that brings about joy, something that brings about wellness for you. Or if you're not home and you're in a public space, um, thinking, you can close your eyes and think about what is one thing that I can identify in my um, in my space, um, even if it's my room, that um, that usually I go to when I need to seek comfort. Um, one thing that I love to do that if you see it in the middle of the slide is saging. Now that's something that everybody is using, um, but it, it goes back to our ancestors. Um, so uh, if you can see in the back, I have like sage always clear and near me. I love candles. I think that aromatherapy is so important and helps our memories and to connect to, to our, our ancestors in my belief. Uh, so, so those are some of the ways that I, um, that I seek wellness. Taking care of plants, right? What are some of the ways that you um, take care of yourself? And if you have anything close to you, please share in the chat. I would be so curious to see what are some of the things that people identify for themselves. Okay. Okay. I love the this last one over here uh, with SpongeBob, where he I, I do that a lot, where I listen to the same song for like a thousand times, just because that really brings me, makes me feel good. It makes me feel um, uh, energetic. It makes me feel better about myself, right? Okay. Has anyone found something around them around their space, or is able to think about something that? Uh, really brings them uh, joy and wellness. Yeah, we've got some people wrote sunbathing, practicing yeah. flute, going into nature or the park, yeah. taking care of my plants. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. I love it. Sunbathing is one. I tell you, I left New York for a reason. I just wanted to be uh, in the California sun. <laughs> Uh, so I, I can sympathize with that one as well. I can identify with that one. Okay. 
Um, so now we are going to go into um, how we can normalize mental illness within our communities, right? And one of the ways that we can do that is looking at the examples that we see in, um, in media, right? Um, like the artists that we uh, hear oftentimes, um, like Selena Gomez and Jay Balvin, all of these wonderful artists that actually spoke up about their mental health um, issues and their uh, struggles with mental health um, and how they were able to uh, engage in treatment and actually be able to empower themselves to, to take care of their needs. Okay. Now, thinking about all these celebrities, right? Shakira, J Balvin, all of these wonderful celebrities that we listen to. If you had all possible access to self-care, like these celebrities do, right? Because um, money is not an issue, let's say. How would you take care of your emotional well-being? What would you do for yourself if you were able, if you didn't have any limitations like these celebrities do? Yeah, or maybe they do have some, but financially, let's say, or access to resources. Please share in the chat how you would take care of your emotional well-being. I know the one that I would be able to do it was, would be getting massages. I think it's so important to bring back the attention to our bodies, right? Part of the avoidance that we sometimes engage in, um, it can feel like even disconnecting completely from our bodies, right? So uh, so if I was Shakira, I would just have a masseuse or a chef right next to me so that they can make me really yummy foods that I love to eat and then also take care of the tension in my body that I, that in my body that I always carry with me. Okay, some people have shared. Oh yeah, we've got, I would take a lot of vacations at the beach. Someone wrote spa for the weekend. Yes. Another participant wrote therapy, monthly solo retreats in nature with no cell service, women's circles, body work, somatic work, getting my hair and skin taken care of more often. Yes. Absolutely. Um, we also have vacations more often, pay for a community garden, invest in early childhood education and family units to include wellness and somatic healing. Amazing. You have all of the best ideas. This is wonderful. Uh, this is really wonderful. And I, I, I really praise all of you for being able to really um, vision, visualize what you would be able to do. And I hope my hope for all of you is that this is something that you can turn into your reality in the future, right? I would definitely love more vacation time. Absolutely. Okay. So now, um, somehow I think I lost one of my slides. Let's see. I apologize for this. Okay. So um, let's talk about um, being able to take charge. And you know what, Anosa, I feel like I just went by, I skipped one of the slides. So if everybody is okay with that, I'm just gonna try to identify it as well. Um, so please forgive me as I go back. Um, and we're, yes, I totally missed it a long time ago. Okay, so I want us to just have a little break, right? We've been talking about so many important issues that affect us and just talking about how we would take care of ourselves, I think is the perfect opportunity to have a dance break, right? Uh, this is something that I encourage all of my patients and clients to do to just really dance it out. Uh, so Nosa, I know you're gonna stop um, the recording. I really hope so. I really hope some people were able to really take those couple of seconds and really dance it out, right? Um, and if you didn't, please do afterwards. <laughs> okay, I see some people are participating in the chat. Okay. So uh, with the hopes that all of you had that little chance to, to really just have a, a minute to have a break and to be energized, I think uh, through dance, and this goes back all the way to like uh, our culture, we really are experts in like moving our bodies and like really expressing our emotions through our body. And uh, I think it's so important to be able to do that, even in your privacy, right? Like shutting down everything around you if possible and just really taking in music or taking in the moment to really express 
what is going through, what you're going through. Okay. So now um, let's move on into how we uh, are going to change uh, the, the narrative, right? How we are going to move out of the stigma of mental health in our communities and how we are going to take charge. And as uh, young people, as professionals in the field, how we can support people to really do that for themselves. So we can start by finding um, media platforms that support mental health, and I'll share some of them with the, with you, um, and sharing it with our friends, with our hermanas and our primas, right? With our circle of women that really need that empowering uh, platform to be able to, to put out there, right? Um, the, the concerns and the issues that affect us and to also have resources to be able to deal and to cope with it all, right? Finding support at school, uh, be it your high schools or be it your colleges, right? Um, and your communities at large, finding um, agencies that really talk about uh, ways to take care of yourself, like the Steve Fund, right? Like finding all of the beautiful resources that are available to you, to youth, to empower ourselves um, and, and break the stigma, right? Start, and that will help us start the conversations with people that we trust, right? Um, to really even share the knowledge. Um, and, and move away from the idea that we don't talk about mental illness or that we don't talk about our sadness and our anxiety. Move away from that. And, and a good resource can be your school counselors too. Uh, they're trained professionals that really are supposed to be there to listen to you and to give you the tools that you need um, or connect you to, to agencies or community resources that are available to really help with the needs that you may have. And we're gonna take some time to really talk about finding a therapist that aligns with your needs. So we're gonna take a look at that briefly, um, but I think it's really important, right? As we rec recognize the, the impact of mental illness in our lives or, or the things that are coming up for us, um, finding a therapist with, uh, that is able to help us. And in some states, I know that can be a little bit tricky, especially for youth. Um, I think in California, uh, as early as the age of 11 or 12, you can find therapy and you don't need your parents' consent, right? But as young adults um, or, you know, as you're like past your 16 or 17 years of age, you might be able to just engage in therapy and not really talk to, uh, have to communicate that to your parents. Sometimes you would need to, right? It, it based on your insurance or for payment, um, payment um, uh, wise, but uh, finding someone that is out there for you. And I'm gonna share some of the resources that are uh, accessible to you. But it, everything starts with making a commitment to yourself, deciding that this is gonna end the intergenerational and uh, the generational trauma that we have been holding or we've been living under, it stops with us, right? We're going to make the commitment that I need to heal in order to help my family heal or to help my future family or people heal with me, okay? Okay. So now how to engage a therapist, right? And this is really important as we go into the journey of taking care of ourselves uh, and the journey of healing, right? Which is long. It's not, a, it doesn't, it's not something that is done in two months, right? So we, we should start by reflecting on what we need. What is coming up for us, especially after looking at the symptoms that, uh, uh, that we discussed earlier, what are some of the things that are coming up for us? And, um, and how, where do I think I need help, right? The hopelessness, that's something that is often um, discussed among youth, right? This feeling, general feeling of hopelessness, that things are not gonna get better, that I'm gonna always live with this pain. I'm always gonna be in this, um, in this space of not really being able to share what's going on for me. So we start by researching online. There's a lot of directories out there that have um, a really big variety and diverse for a uh, diverse population of mental health professionals um, that identify as Latinx um, or that have experience um, working with uh, BIPOC, uh, which is Black, Indigenous, and people of color, right? And that are trained for, for working with uh, people of color. Uh, one of them is Therapy for Latinx. Um, Psychology Today also has a really big um, online directory of mental health professionals, including psychiatrists. Um, 
Mental Health America also has amazing resources and a lot of education, even to just have the conversations about mental health with our peers. Openpathcollective.org is actually one that is uh, very affordable as well. If you're looking for a therapist, this is one to, to think about. Sometimes even going into these other online directories, you if, if you don't have insurance or even if you do, uh, talking to the provider to see if they can have if they have a sliding scale. Sometimes they are able to accommodate, especially for you, understanding that they, uh, you know, may not be working or may be financially um, more limited, right? But it's not a reason to not seek help. Uh, inclusive therapist is also a really good online directory. And when you go into this um, research online, it's important to really read the provider's bio, right? Like what are they presenting? What are their expertise? Do they have experience working with the Latinx community or people of color, right? Are they culturally competent and trained to work with, uh, with different cultural groups, right? Do, are they, do they work with depression or anxiety? If this is something that concerns me, right? Do they work with like life transitions, right? And like talking about adjustment to, uh, to situations or like, um, it, you know, uh, if things affecting our families, do they work with that, with racism and discrimination, right? Are they, are they advocates for social justice? All of these questions. And, um, and for the most part, all of the providers that are in, in these websites offer a 15 minute uh, free consultation call. So asking for that, right? Can we connect over the phone so that we can talk about your experiences? Yeah, I can tell you a little bit about what's coming up for me to see if it's, it's the right match. It's really, really important to find the right match. And sometimes you might engage in therapy with, with a provider and, and might actually realize that you, it's not a good connection. It's not someone that uh, you're feeling um, an alliance with. And it's okay to, to seek somewhere, some, somewhere else or someone else. Okay. Uh, this is just to, uh, to show you how their logos look like. Really important, the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Uh, for anyone that is experiencing um, uh, some crisis in the moment and really need to talk to somebody, this is a resource that you can use 24-7 and it's available in all, so many languages. So seeking out for help. Psychology Today, like I said, Therapy for Black Girls. These are some of the, of the uh, online resources that I was talking about earlier. Uh, we also uh, have the Steve to um, uh, text to Steve, which is a Steve fun uh, resource that where you can speak to someone uh, if you're experiencing a crisis, also 24 seven. Is, uh, if you if it's someone that uh, if you identify as someone that speaks Spanish, they have uh, people available to be able to help uh, and follow social media at the Steve Fund for more support and more resources. Okay. Okay, so let's take a, a moment to just go through questions, thoughts, any um, anything to take uh, from what we've talked about today. And as you um, input your questions or your thoughts into the chat, I will uh, will uh, put this uh, quote that I think is um, really important to the topic that we've been talking about today. Um, and Frida Kahlo is one of the people that I really admire um, and a source of empowerment for me, uh, someone that really struggled with mental health issues along with physical ailments. Um, and she says, don't build a wall, a wall around your own suffering or it may devour you from the inside. How important it is to listen to this, right? How important it is to, to recognize when we are putting up walls, when we are putting up barriers um, to protect ourselves, to safeguard ourselves because nothing else feels safe. Um, but to understand that in doing so and in, in, in not reaching out for help or seeking help, um, it may be eating you Right. maybe causing more harm. Are we getting any questions through the chat? 
No questions. A lot of love, though. You've been getting a lot of heart reacts. Someone said, love to be able to participate in spaces like this. Looking forward to any upcoming discussions or resources for myself and to share with clients. Perfect. Perfect. I love that. Thank you so much for being here. It's really meaningful. Okay. So some takeaways from today, um, and uh, Enosa is going to input in the chat uh, also some of the resources that uh, we put together for you. One of them is how to choose a therapist and going through the steps of like going into that journey, right? And especially as we talked about going into online directories and looking for uh, a provider. And also uh, a receta for self-care and practicing um, uh, healthy coping skills to really um, uh, take care of ourselves. So you look at look for that in the chat. So some takeaways from today: mental health is imperative and is necessary to live a healthy and happy life. Um, we recognize the challenges in our community and the impact that it has, uh, the the social issues have in young Latinx women, right? Um, the psychological strengths of Latinx people. So so it really tells us that we have we have demonstrated that we have the power to overcome uh, some of the most difficult hurdles that our ancestors have gone through, that our families have gone through. And that's important to know so that uh, we can use that to move forward ourselves, right? To remember our determination and our resourcefulness. And more importantly, normalizing mental health for young Latinx people, right? This is real. It's real and complex, and that means that it needs to be taken care of. Okay. Um, and to end, um, I want us to do a wellness or an empowering commitment. So if you identify as a Latinx youth, I want you to uh, think about how you will show up for yourself, right? I will show up for myself in, right? In holding conversations, in holding space, um, with my peers uh, about mental health issues, right? How can you advocate for yourself within your schools, within your families, within the people uh, that um, are part of your life? How can you advocate for your own needs, for your own mental health needs? And if you work with the Latinx youth, um, if you provide services, how can you show up for Latinx women, right? In the form of like um, seeking more uh, training, right? More culturally competent training um, and, uh, and engaging in practices that really show up for the needs of the Latinx community. And how can you become an advocate? So take a second to just think about how you would do that for yourselves and for the people that you work with. I will share with all of you that one of the ways I, uh, as I continuously work with Latinx um, women, um, one of the things that I have uh, really been telling the people that I work with, the patients that I work with, especially in maternal mental health, is, um, and as Latinas, is this uh, notion that we, we hold our questions, we hold what our fears, and we don't talk to providers, right? We are fearful of the medical field, and we don't speak up when there's something that's happening for us. So I always tell all of the patients and clients that I work with, if something is if something is wrong or it feels wrong or if you don't understand what's happening and what is um, how, what you're being taken care of in the medical field, right? Then you have to ask questions. Do not stay with your thoughts and with your questions to yourself. It's important to speak up. Okay. So I'm gonna end with uh, this quote that um, I'll be honest, I've had this quote since I started um, my master's degree uh, for social work, and I still have it to this day as part of my signature in my email. Uh, and I think it's so powerful, uh, and especially for, for today. Um, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can de decide not to be reduced by it. I think this is very important. Okay, please go into uh, uh, our survey and please let us know how you feel about today's topic and this, um, uh, this conversation that we've had today. Or, um, and please feel free to share uh, your thoughts about this. Um, 
to leave it there for a second. And more importantly, thank you so much for B, for holding the space with me, for listening to me, for sharing your thoughts and your questions. Uh, muchas gracias desde el fondo de mi corazón. Thank you all.